Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Record numbers of women are running for office this year, and unfortunately, that means record numbers have been targeted for harassment and abuse. This week, we'll talk about the upside of having so many more women engaged in politics and government, and the dark side that inevitably accompanies any significant advance by women in our society. My guest is Debbie Walsh, director of the Center for Women in Politics at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University. Debbie, hi, thanks for coming in. Happy to be here, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. So um, the surge of women candidates is something to celebrate, and we've got record numbers, as I mentioned, this year, but talk a little bit about some of the um, harassment and the hard times that some of these candidates have been facing. Well, I like to stress the upside, right? <laughs> I like to stress the fact that we, we are seeing that. record numbers yeah. of women. But it is true that some of the women who are running are facing harassment, largely online harassment. Um, and I think that this is something that we've seen for women whenever they're striving for leadership positions, when they're moving up in the ranks of any of other professions as well this ability to harass, and I think online forums make it very easy for people to do it in a pretty cowardly way, right? It's, it's this anonymous stalking, it's this anonymous right. harassment, and it's something that women who are running for office have to face. Um, I think they're handling it. I don't think it should be an obstacle to their running. Um, it is one of a number of challenges that women face when they think about running for office and when you break through into the power structure and you're trying to, to assert yourself and have a voice. There are people out there who don't want you to have that voice, who want to see the status quo stay the same. And they may take this cowardly route by going, sitting in their basements and stalking them online, saying terrible things about them online. But we've seen this for women um, in the gaming industry. They have taken extreme abuse um, right. online. Um, we've seen it for women office holders out in Seattle, uh, where a majority of the city council was female. Uh, they had a vote on funding for a new sports arena. And when the city council voted it down, the women on the city council were targeted, this is a couple of years ago, right. were targeted online with really violent, awful emails and posts. And they withstood it, and they're fine. And <laughs> you know, this, is, this right. is unfortunately part of what is in politics these days and something that particularly affects women. I mean, you make a good point. It's not just candidates. I mean, office holders, too. I mean, once women office take holders. office. And I think when women are breaking into spheres that are seen as largely male mm -hmm. um, and are trying to go into places where some people may not particularly welcoming them. Um, from what you've seen, um, how do the candidates or the office holders, uh, when some of this stuff gets is really over the top, um, how have they reacted? I mean, are, are they um, stoic? Have, um, uh, have you seen instances where uh, people have been intimidated? What are, what are some of the well, things the, that you've seen? Well, the most seen? unfortunate example, I think, was in Iowa, where one of the women who was running for Congress early on, uh, the second time she was running, and had a very good shot, I think, at winning that nomination, a woman named Kim Weaver, mm -hmm. chose to step out of the race. Um, and I, I think that is unfortunate. Um, I think most of the women are either not responding, which I think is the kind of general conventional wisdom, don't respond, right? It's like don't read the comments section of uh, any <laughs> article that you're quoted in or it's that a, you're writing. It's the same thing if you, if you write a column. Don't right. read the comments. Don't read the comments. <laughs> don't read the comments because the people who do, many of the people who do respond do it in this way. So I think it, there has been 
the conventional wisdom, I think, has been to let it go. But I do think that there is a point when there is negative campaigning, and I think that's a different aspect, where we've seen research that has said to women, you know, if there's a negative assertion made about you, particularly by your opponent, um, it used to be don't respond. But now we know that women, in fact, take a a bigger fall for that kind of negative attack. And so it's important to respond to that sort of a negative attack. You don't go on and on and give it legs, right. but you respond to it and move on, and that actually helps women candidates. Now, I agree with you. Uh, we don't want to give the wrong impression. I mean, there have been so many um, women, and um, the New York Times had a story um, where uh, some of these, these candidates have talked about how terrific it is uh, to run for office. And there was a quote from uh, one woman who said, I cannot communicate to you strongly enough. Overall, this job is fun, this job is exhausting, uh, but this job uh, is amazing. So uh, talk a little bit about the uh, bright side, the, the women who do run for office and who do um, win office. Uh, What's that like? I mean, you probably ask the same thing about a guy, but, but what's it like? Absolutely. Well, we actually just did some terrific research looking at the impact of women in office, particularly looking at women in Congress. And we were lucky enough to be able to interview 84 of the women who served in the 114th Congress. And overwhelmingly, we heard from them, Democrats and Republicans, how rewarding it is to actually serve. Uh, it's hard work to get there, but <laughs> once you're there, you actually get to make a difference. Right. Um, we did a project a number of years ago to try to encourage more women to run for office from professions that aren't normally the kind of targeted group of potential <laughs> candidates, right. women who are engineers or in medicine right. or small business owners. And one of the things we did was we talked to women elected officials and asked them to speak to groups of women to talk about wow. the rewards of running for office. And they would talk about the things that wouldn't have happened had they not been there. And I think that is important to remember in this moment when we're talking about the negative aspect. Right. There's also tremendous positives of running for office where you really do get to make a difference in people's lives in big ways and in small ways. Which has to be satisfying. I, mean. I, I think otherwise, why would people put, put themselves through <laughs> oh, it? Really, exactly, it right. is hard work. Getting elected is hard work. Um, it's, uh, it's grueling physically and mentally, uh, but once you are there, once you actually get to serve, I think it really gives you a voice. You get to have a voice on the issues that you care about, whether it's health care issues, environmental issues, education issues. You have a way of making a difference for the communities in which you live. So um, we mentioned the surge of women candidates. Um, this year, um, record numbers. Record numbers. Why? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I have a, yeah, I have a suspicion. Yeah, you have a feeling. You have <laughs> a suspicion of what's going on. Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing big record numbers um, for the U.S. House. Uh, we're seeing almost sixty percent more women running this wow. time than, two, than the, the previous record. For governor, it's up almost eighty percent. Um, so we're not just breaking the records, we're blowing through those records. And these records are largely being set on the Democratic side. Right. It is a surge of Democratic women who are running for office this time around. And there are lots of reasons that go into the decision to run, but we do think that a big trigger for this surge that we've seen this year has been the election of Donald right. Trump um, and the defeat of Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, I think women woke up the day after the election and thought, you know, we were a little worried that they might wake up the day after and just sort of crawl under the covers and just say they discouraged. give up, they give yeah. up on politics. But in fact, it really has clearly seemed to energize women. Um, there's a real realization that elections have consequences, that women could not afford to sit on the sidelines. They can't wait for there to be a candidate out there um, who's going to care about the issues they care about. They really, I think, saw, and we're seeing this across the country, that realization that if you want to have candidates and office holders that look like you, that sound like you, that care about the issues you care about, guess what? They needed to be that candidate, and they ran. And so we're seeing a surge in the number of women running. We're also seeing an increase, by the way, in the number of men who are running right. for office. And with all of the talk of the surge, I will be a little 
a little bit of a downer. Women are still only, were still only about a quarter of all of the filed candidates for Congress this year. So, Which gives a sense of how few absolutely. there have been traditionally. Absolutely. So we're, we saw an increase in the proportion. Women were a couple of years ago about 20 percent, 21 percent. This year they're about a quarter. It's moving up. It's still slow. We're still underrepresented going beyond the candidacies now, the demonstrations that started uh, immediately after, um, at the inauguration. Uh, and, and so, I mean, the turnout was uh, staggering, protests all across, yes. the, across the country, not just in Washington. I remember um, looking at what was going on in New York and I was really astounded yep. at the number of people um, who had turned out. But you have women running for office, you have people protesting, uh, demonstrating, organizing, uh, raising money. Um, it feels like, obviously, it's a reaction uh, to a great degree uh, to, to Trump and the election, but it feels like there's really something in, in the form of a movement going on. I think there is a movement happening, and I think that it is about um, realizing that some of the gains that have been made are fragile mm -hmm. and that inattention to the political process can lead to um, a regression in some of the gains that people feel they've, been, they've right. made. I think one of the signs that we saw all over in Washington and in New York and in other cities was, I'm still having to, to fight about this. <laughs> um, right. And I think that's part of what happened as a result of that election. And I think we are seeing a movement, and I hope that it's a movement that lasts. Um, you know, I hope that people don't sort of go through this election and then sort of say, okay, we're done with that. Mm -hmm. That there's st this level of engagement continues. We saw the response almost instantaneously. We run a nonpartisan campaign training program in New Jersey. We have partners in about 20 states. It's called Ready to Run. And we were a little concerned right after the election that women would not even want to register for our program that was happening that March. Normally, by the end of, an, uh, of the calendar year, we would have had about maybe four or five people who had paid to register for that program. Starting the day of the election, we started to see an increase. By the end of the year, we had 100 women already registered. That was before the march. Um, at the march in Washington, there were women who put on their Emily's List and a group called Higher Heights, which is a pack for black women interested in running for office. Um, they, they did a, a campaign training right after the march, and they had over 500 women who wow. showed up. This was something that we've seen now across the country with our partner programs, not just in places like New Jersey, but in Oklahoma, in Utah, in Ohio, and Illinois. This right. kind of energy and excitement is across the country. Um, and the question is, is it a one-off? Or will it be part of a continuing movement? Well, you anticipated one of my questions because you mentioned ready to run. And um, I wanted to get a sense, um, and you can explain it now, of, for example, with a program like Ready to Run, what is it that you guys do? And then overall, what's the point of the center? Uh, what, are you, what are you trying to achieve? Sure. So our Ready to Run program is, as I said, is a nonpartisan campaign training program for women, which we run in New Jersey as a kind of a laboratory. Um, and then we bring partner programs from other nonpartisan organizations around the country who will start their own state-based programs. And our belief is that these programs need to be state-based. They can't be sort of a national drop-in, teach how to run for office and leave, because politics is very different state by state. How you run an o for right. office in New Jersey is very, very different than how you run for office in Iowa or Utah <laughs> or Ohio. Right. And so they need to really be grounded in a state institution. And we want to have an impact on the culture of the state, really to bring the idea of women's political empowerment into the state culture. So we're really pleased that those programs now happen in about 20 states and we teach the nuts and bolts of running a campaign, campaign organization, fundraising, working with the media, social media. This is all part, uh, you know, this is one part of the work that we do at the center. The center is about to actually in a couple of years celebrate its 50th anniversary. Wow. Um, and we were founded with the mission of really telling the story of women's changing role and participation in American politics. 
Um, we research uh, various aspects of women's participation. How do women get into office? How are their routes into office different than men? What difference does it make to have them there? We keep track of the numbers and the story of women's participation. How many women are running for office every cycle? How many women are serving? We look at race and ethnicity. Um, we want to see geographic changes and shifts. We also look at women as voters. Um, we know that w since 1980, women have been voting differently than men. We want to see what impact those women voters have on the outcome of elections. And then we take that research and we make it accessible to the activist community um, on both sides of the aisle to make sure that they're more effective as they try to increase the numbers of women in office. And then we do our own programs to make sure that there are more women in office. So our nonpartisan Ready to Run program, but also a program called New Leadership, which is National Education for Women's Leadership, which is an intensive public leadership training program for college women. So I think of it as kind of the long-term investment right. with college women to make sure that young women care about all kinds of issues in their community, understand how politics affects those issues and that they can have a voice there. And then the short-term investment for women who want to run right now. The, uh, this will sound like an obvious question, but why is it important to have more women running for office and engaged uh, even in other ways in, in um, government and politics? Well, we know from the research that women make a difference. We know that women have different life experiences than men, and they bring those life experiences to the making of public policy. Um, their priorities are different. We know that women in both parties are more likely to have as an issue priority issues affecting women, families, children. Um, they're looking at the world through that gendered lens and that just has an impact on everything that they do and everything that they see. We also know that women are more likely to have the ability, it seems, to work across the aisle. Um, we know, for example, the women in the United States Senate still, even in the midst of all of the partisan rancor out there, are still meeting together on a regular basis for dinner. We don't know exactly what they talk about, but we can only imagine that if high-powered policymakers are meeting, they're probably talking a little bit about policy. It doesn't mean that they agree with each other on right. everything, but it means they have a human relationship. And that's really what's been missing in Washington these days, that ability to just talk to each other, have mutual respect. And when the government shut down, um, it was women in the United States Senate that really brought, brought the two parties together to talk. Uh, Susan Collins from Maine, a Republican, right. was convening groups of Democratic and Republican senators with her talking stick, allowing <laughs> those senators to actually have conversations about how to end the shutdown. Right. So it really matters to have more women the way it matters to have more diversity in general. You know, we want more women, we want more women of color, we want people of color, we want different different socioeconomic backgrounds because everybody brings their own experience to the table. And if we only have the experience of white male attorneys, it's a right. problem. I agree. The, uh, you, the, the women running for office obviously want to win their elections, but you made the point, and I thought it was really interesting, that getting elected is not the only positive outcome that we can expect and that we should be or that we should be looking for and that it's not the only measure of success. Explain what you meant by that. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of hype about the the surge of women running for office. It's not hype, but it's a, been a lot of coverage of that mm -hmm. story. Um, but a lot of these women are running as challengers. Uh, over half of the women who are running for House races now are running as challengers in the general election. Those are tough races. Thirteen women aren't running for re-election. We're going to see an increase in the number of women serving, but it's, it, it's not going to be what we saw in 1992 when we doubled the number of women in Congress. Right. And I don't want that to be the expectation. I don't want that to be the only way we measure what happens. Um, there are many other ways to look at success. I think the activism that you were talking about earlier is a measure of the success of this moment. Um, seeing women, not just the women who are running for office, but the women who are engaged, um, working for other people who are running for office, marching in the streets, giving money, being mm -hmm. donors to candidates, women and men, um, that they care about, being more active in the political process. 
I think some of the first that we've already seen are really significant and important. Stacey Abrams winning the nomination for governor in Georgia. Mm -hmm. The first black woman nominated by a major party for governor. If she wins, she'll be the first black woman governor. But even if she doesn't win, that is a big step. It's a real advance. Yeah, we are likely to see the first Native American woman ever elected to Congress in this cycle from New Mexico. She'll be coming from New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Texas has never elected a Latina to Congress. Um, And we are likely to see one or two Latinas representing Texas in Congress. Um, These are important firsts. they're, they're important steps. We're also seeing, I think, some fundamental shifts in the paradigm of why women run for office. In the past, in our, all of our research, we've really seen that women are more likely to run when they're recruited mm-hmm. um, for office. This time around, I think we're seeing something different. I think we're seeing women, nobody asked them to run. <laughs> it's they're more just, spontaneous. They're they, just right. stepping up and running. They like they have to do they it. They have to do it. And I think you're seeing some big success stories out of that. The Presley race in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts here in New York, obviously, with yep. Alexandria, uh, Alexandria's race. I, I think what we're seeing there are women who knew that if they waited the way everybody always tells you to wait, they tell women to wait. Um, You'll just keep waiting. They'll just keep waiting. And the reality was that in that district that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez won in, when finally the incumbent chose not to run, she was very unlikely to be the pick of the party to run for office. So they're just she would not have been. So she just said, you know what, I'm going to do it now. I'm not going to wait. And it paid off. And I think that's a new paradigm for women who are running for office. And that could make a big difference. I thought it was also interesting that uh, she won in a, in a race where, one, obviously no one expected her to win, but also she was not getting any coverage. She wasn't getting any attention outside of her district. That's right. And yet she still pulled off this tremendous upset. Well, she did that hard work that you have to do, right? <laughs> she did that door to door. Her ad was terrific, right? It, it talked about how I'm not what a congressperson is supposed to look like. And then she went out and she knocked on every door um, and she paid attention to the district. And the district had shifted, it had changed. It was a different place. And I think it was a huge lesson, right, for the status quo that you can't count on certain things anymore. You have to work hard. Uh, right, and exactly and right. she did, and, and frankly, he didn't. Uh, and it, no, he, he took it for, he he took took it for it granted. granted. Yep. And I think what you saw in Massachusetts, I think um, Presley's opponent kind of woke up a little and, and didn't take it <laughs> right. for granted, but she still won. She still and won. again, yeah. I think she's another great example of if she had waited her turn, Um, her turn would never have come. The party would never have said, oh, you are the candidate of our dreams and we're going to have you run. Uh, So she just stepped up and she ran. And I think we're going to see more of that in the future. So we've only got a minute or so left. How did you get involved in this sort of thing and and, um, to the uh, degree and, and, and with the intensity that you've applied to it? Well, Part of it was I grew up in a really political family. Uh, I, uh, we were talking earlier. I grew up in the West Village in New York, um, and in, Just a great place in the to '60s, right. and you could not <laughs> be a, about a, a politics. Great, a great place to grow up at that time. at that time, yeah. and so politics was something that we did talk about at the dinner right. table. Um, it was something that we didn't just talk about, but my parents lived, and they were active, and they were engaged and involved, and I always cared about it, um, and when I actually ended up at Rutgers in graduate school because of the Center for American Women in Politics. It was there then. I read about it at the time. The (laughs) article that I read was in the style section of the New York Times. The style section. And that is how I heard about the Center for American Women in Politics. Well, it's fantastic. Keep up the good work. Debbie Walsh, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, We'll be back in a moment with a final word. There has been some controversy surrounding former President Barack Obama's decision to energetically and enthusiastically make his presence felt in this year's congressional elections. The former president has made no effort to hide his disdain for Donald Trump and his contempt 
for what the GOP has become. What happened to the Republican Party, he asked. Its central organizing principle in foreign policy was the fight against communism, and now they're cozying up to the former head of the KGB. Moreover, he said, they're actively blocking legislation that would protect our elections from foreign interference. What happened? In his critique of Trump and his GOP followers, Obama said, we're Americans. We're supposed to stand up to bullies, not follow them. We're supposed to stand up to discrimination, and we're sure as heck supposed to stand up clearly and unequivocally to Nazi sympathizers. Critics have complained that it was unseemly for Obama to launch such a full-throated attack on his successor, that traditionally former presidents have not done that. That may be true, but these are extraordinary and extremely dangerous times. We have a man in the White House who is not equipped intellectually or emotionally to be president. He doesn't read. He doesn't understand the issues. He's a bigot. He doesn't appreciate the alliances that have helped protect us since World War II. He believes the Justice Department should protect Republican criminals and prosecute Democratic opponents who have done nothing wrong. He believes our free press is the enemy of the American people. Those are just a handful of the problems with the Trump presidency. Donald Trump is a threat to American democracy, to our pluralistic traditions, to our very way of life. And the Republicans who control Congress have been unwilling to raise even the faintest of voices in opposition. Barack Obama had an obligation to speak out, and thank goodness he did. What is happening to our country and its politics is not normal and not good. That's all for now. See you next time.